I think I should preface my remarks by saying, just as a personal observation, that I don't believe I've seen any summary of activities that exceeds the ambassador's accomplishments over a number of years. And I think you'll find it interest, interesting to you. If you'll bear with me, I'll go through a major portion of them. Given Ambassador Todman's unusually far-ranging experience as a foreign service officer, we've asked him to speak not only with attention to his responsibilities in Denmark, but also the general theme of America and the world and Ambassador's view. Ambassador Todman has previously served in four ambassadorial posts, Chad, Guinea, Costa Rica, Spain, and as Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs. He has extensive experience in Europe, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, and the United Nations. At present, he is focusing his attention on arms control as ambassador to Don Denmark, and while ambassador to Spain, he helped negotiate the United States Bases Agreement and Spain's entry, excuse me, entry into the political structure of NATO. In Latin America, he served not only in Costa Rica, but was Assistant Secretary of State during the Panama Canal negotiations, the establishment of a United States interest office in Cuba and the early work on the Caribbean Basin Initiative. In Sub-Saharan Africa, before serving as ambassador to Chad and ambassador to Guinea, he was stationed in Togo and was desk officer for Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and the Seychelles. In North Africa, he was political officer in Tunis. He was posted to Beirut for training in the Arab affairs, and he served in New Delhi after beginning his career as desk officer for India, Nepal, and Ceylon. Additionally, he served trusteeship in the Bureau of International Organization Affairs. Among his many awards as Foreign Service Officer is the Presidential Distinguished Service Award, one of seven given for Foreign Service Officers in 1985. His broad and long experience qualify him particularly well to address the theme, America and the World, an Ambassador's View. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Terence A. Todman, Ambassador of the United States to Denmark. Ambassador Todman. I would like to thank Mr. Patterson for making such an excellent summary of what obviously must not have been a summary in the first place because you included everything there in it. Members of the Board of Trustees of the Council, guests, ladies and gentlemen, I truly am very delighted to be here with you this evening. And I want to thank all of you for coming on such very short notice. I can assure you that uh, perhaps you might find some consolation in knowing that my notice was even shorter. I think you probably were figuring that I only had to get one person here, and Dr. Bird had the tremendous job which he had done so magnific magnificently in getting all of you together. When I was told about this uh, a couple of days ago before going off on a couple of speaking engagements, I was told the subject would be America and the world, uh, an ambassador's view. I was very grateful to find an ambassador's view added behind America and the world because it was a way of absolving everybody else from whatever remarks I might uh, make here tonight. I know that the President and the Secretary of State will be as indulgent with me as usual and say, there goes Terry Todman again, telling it all in two minutes. Well, I think I'll speak for a little bit more than two minutes, uh, but I do encourage you to uh, think both about things that I do say and things that I might uh, neglect to say so that we can have a good discussion period afterwards. I say discussion rather than question and answer because one of the things I'm proud about in working with the State Department and working in foreign policy and being in this country is that we have the flexibility and the openness to keep adjusting our foreign policy to the wisdom that we get from the American people. This makes it the dynamic 
process that it should be and ensures that all of the varying interests are fed into what should make the policy. I guess I have moved around the world and been in the Foreign Service for a time that does permit me to reflect a little on what are some of the major changes that I note and what are some of the major challenges that I see today. Thirty-four years ago, when I began my Foreign Service career, the major interests that I was working on at that time, I moved strict, uh, directly from India, Ceylon, Nepal into trusteeship and non-self-governing territories, was a question of colonialism. Because so much of the world was still ruled by what we refer to as the metropoles, the major European countries that had their empires uh, stretching across the world, one of which could boast that the sun never set on that particular empire. During the time, during the years since then, and I like to feel that I've had some role in it, what we have seen is a wave of independence. I hope I'm responsible for the crest and not for the depths. But one thing that occurred to me was that the, uh, once the United Nations got seriously into the question of dependent areas, we reminded all of the metropolitan powers that they had a sacred trust, particularly in the case of the trust territories, to bring those areas to self-government or independence. And when they were asked when are these countries going to be independent or self-governing, the answer was always, how can we tell what's going to happen in so many years? And we were given the amount of time that it would take to train people from the grammar schools and produce professionals and those who could run a country and govern themselves. Uh, I joined with a colleague in suggesting that maybe if we could encourage the metropolitan powers to suggest what they would do in the next three to five years to move the territories toward self-government or independence, we would then have a meaningful yardstick by which we could measure the progress. Uh, we did succeed in selling that to the administration and the policy of intermediate targets and dates uh, was established, pressed by us and accepted by the United Nations. And so the countries had to give some account of what they would do in three to five years to advance uh, the trust territories or colonies on the road to independence. The difference in that was that each year when the General Assembly met, or the trusteeship council, you could say, how have you done on that short-term goal? And I have no doubt that this helped move the, pro the process along. It didn't always work so orderly. In the case of the Belgian Congo, it was just when it got to be too uncomfortable for the metropole to stay there, that all of a sudden, without any preparation, without any of the other attributes of independence that the said were necessary, they became independent. More recently, we have seen some of the uh, larger European countries, I suppose, tire of the job of having colonies and throw them out. So that we ended up with a large number of newly independent countries, uh, many of which really don't have the viability for an independent existence. And yet, believing as we all do and practicing as we do in this world, the idea of equality for all sovereign nations, we find that all of these countries, regardless of their size or possibility or specific weight in any area, have exactly the same right as the United States does, or any other country. This has produced some truly enormous problems for the international community on how to deal 
with all of these newly emerged countries without the experience, without the ability, without the capacity to do the kinds of things to which they were led to believe that they should and could aspire. I see that as one of the fundamental changes in this time. Another one that has had a major impact, I think, has been the revolution in technology. You think of the world uh, 34 years ago, 30 years ago, and you think of the world today in terms of what can happen in the field of technology and in communication. There have been enormous benefits, of course, but there have been enormous problems created. One of the areas where the impact of this, I think, has been significant is in the military field, because we have now been able to develop weapons of mass destruction and with accuracy that are just so enormous that human existence could very well be threatened. The challenge that this poses, of course, is one of the major ones that we have to deal with. And I say we because the United States is a global power. Our geography forces this on us. Our history forces this on us. Our resources force this on us. And because of the ideological basis on which our great country was founded, the belief in democracy, in freedom, in equality, we have to insist that it exists around the world for others if it is to have any meaning for us. Therefore, we have been thrust on the stage, uh, on the world stage, to ensure that we do play our role to keep our basic interests protected. Every government has, as its responsibility, of course, ensuring the security of its people, because without that security, there isn't anything else. This was true before. It's quite as true today, except that the impact of the wave of independence and of the technological revolution means that we are working in an atmosphere that is far more complex, far more dangerous than any that we have known before. Today we are facing a Soviet Union that is expansionist and that now has with the intercontinent intercontinental ballistic missiles with their multiple warheads the capability to threaten destruction. So far, we have managed, as the threat has shown itself, to reach agreement with like-minded friends and allies, both here on the continent of North America, Canada to be specific, and with Western Europe to join in protecting our basic interests and our desire for freedom and free enterprise. This has happened, as you know, through NATO, and it has worked extraordinarily well. It has managed to keep strategic stability and peace in Europe throughout its existence. And in fact, the very success that it has had has resulted in a number of people now beginning to say, why is it there? They can afford to ask, why, why is it there? Because it is there. And whenever the question then gets too serious, then they begin to realize that really, this has made a difference. But while we have managed to keep that peace through the strength of NATO, we have done so on a basis that has created a great deal of tension and unease in our own country and throughout the world. Because we have relied for security throughout this time on offense, counter-offense, in our case, counter-offense. But I'm sure that the Soviets would say the same thing. We've been involved in what has been described as the doctrine of mutual assured destruction, or MAD for short. And it is madness, because what we have been telling our people up to now is, never mind if there's an attack that kills half of you, 
we will have the ability to counterattack and maybe kill more than half of them. Who wants that kind of a world? Who wants that kind of, to live in that sort of a situation? One of the advantages of new and emergent technologies is that we have been able to reach the stage where the president felt able to announce his dream and a dream which I think should be shared by all, that one day we can move from reliance for security on offense and counter-offense to reliance on defense. And if the offensive weapons could no longer threaten the existence of the other side, they would then really be useless and one could much more readily reach agreement to eliminate them. This is a dream that we are trying to pursue. It's a dream made possible by this technological change. The risk was created by it. The solution may very well lie in it. What will be the outcome? When will we know the answers? We don't know. What we do know is that we have to find some way to be able to provide for our security and for the defense of our way of life and our freedom without reliance on offense and counter-offense. We approach this through negotiation. We recognize that the Soviets want, need, and should have security just as we should. And this is why the president made a proposal of open laboratories. You look at what we're doing in this defensive area, we'll see what you're doing. Together we can work out true space and defense talks, way that we can shift the balance, shift the arrangement for strategic stability from offense counter offense on to instead greater reliance on defense. At the same time, we are talking about massive reductions in arms of all sorts, provided of course that they must be verifiable, they must be equitable, they must leave this stability, the strategic stability, which is so important for us. So that is one of the major factors with which we have to deal and will continue to deal. We keep hoping and we must hope that the Soviets want to see peace, want to be able to prosper enough that one day the other side will in fact sit down and be willing to negotiate seriously to bring about a reduction. As we have faced these problems of security, we have faced, faced simultaneously a number of conflicts in small, uh, smaller conflicts on a regional or a national scale. And this too has had a tremendous impact on our lives. In many cases, these conflicts have nothing to do with the East-West uh, issues that do exist. Many of the, the newly independent countries, those that have emerged from this wave of which I spoke, find that they are unable to meet the basic needs. They look for quick and easy solutions, and they're seduced by the ideas that somehow statist approach somehow central planning can bring about answers to their needs. The failures that are all around the world on this somehow never seem to impress them because each one thinks that this time I'll be smart enough and able enough to make it work. Well it hasn't worked and it won't work because the essential dynamo, the motto of uh, progress is what comes from within the will of the individual that creative potential that lies in each of us is what makes uh, our societies move forward. But while many of the problems in these newly independent areas or in the regional or the third world and not East West, a number of them are. Certainly in the case of Afghanistan, what you have is not something that they have created but just a massive military uh, invasion, attempting to crush out the liberty of a people. You have the case of Cambodia, 
and the Vietnamese moving in. You have right here in Central America the problems that are happening particularly in, in Nicaragua today. Problems which uh, I, I, I must say, not with any particular pride, that I spoke about during my period as Assistant Secretary of State. We've got to be able to deal with these and it's one reason why when we talk to the Soviets we refuse to let our agenda be limited to questions of disarmament or arms control. We insist that there must be discussion of these regional conflicts as well. To these regional conflicts has been added perhaps one is one of the most striking and terrible things and developments of this time since I have been in the Foreign Service and that is the scourge of terrorism. I can still remember my early days in the Foreign Service when one loved the idea of being able to go around freely, openly, to have the embassies open to everyone who would come in, always with the security that if you were somehow attached to a diplomatic mission you had very special protection. And in fact, people sought refuge, if they were being pursued, in diplomatic missions. Today, people run away from diplomatic missions because they know that's likely to be the first to be violated. And now it's gone beyond that. It's gone around the world. It's gone indiscriminately so that you never know when or where a terrorist act is going to strike out and no place is safe from it. In Scandinavia, where uh, they, they boast, and rightfully so, of the peaceful, agreeable, open climate that they have and where nothing will ever happen, you have had in Denmark in the just over two and a half years that I've been there, uh, three terrorist attacks now. And these are with bombs exploding and blowing up places. Uh, a synagogue and an old people's home in one case, a Northwest Airlines office in another case, a delicatessen uh, in another case, so that today they know, and it's known around the world, that no one is safe from this. And we know that terrorism can never be appeased. You can never say that the threat or the use of this instrument is going to produce the kinds of result that those who use it would like to. And one of the satisfying things is to note that uh, recently many of the European countries who at first thought that maybe we were being too stern or too serious about this met and decided that they too had to begin moving from words to concrete action because words alone are not enough. So we have that problem also that we must deal with. We have a problem which I know must be of particular interest to you, to many of you, because of your involvement in the corporate world and the economic structure. And that's the impact of the, techno of the technological changes on economies around the world. Today, within two minutes after an announcement is made in the White House, stock markets react all around the world. Prices fluctuate. Uh, prices of goods that move in international trade change. And you find nations doing what they can to protect their own markets. In, our, in the case, that, uh, case with which I get involved fairly frequently, the European uh, Economic Community are great friends working together very well in NATO on security matters. Yet when it comes to trying to be able to sell their goods out, it gets to be a little tough. And in cases like that, we just have to go and say, no, we're working together in all of those other areas, but we're not going to do it at the point of letting you pass your problems off on us. We're having now, as you know, major discussions over who is to bear the economic burden of uh, Spain's entry into the common market. We favor it strongly. We want to see a very strong uh, European community because strong trading partners are in our interest. But at the same time, it can't be, everything can't be at American expense. We've got to find ways to deal with that. 
So the economic area and the interrelationship have changed enormously. Countries that used to be major importers are today major exporters of some of the same products that we used to sell. We need to be able to make adjustments to that. Uh, one thing I intended to mention about the third world I might go back to, we have to find ways to help the third world solve the problems. Whether those problems are between countries uh, in conflict with each other or whether they're internal problems. The kind of assistance that we give have to be looked at. Sometimes we need economic uh, or military assistance. Sometimes we need to give moral or political support. Sometimes the, the assistance is best given openly. Sometimes it's best given in a way where the hand does, does not show. But these are things that we have to look at because we cannot avoid the responsibility of dealing with problems that arise in the third world because they impact quite as much on the United States. I'll mention one last feature that I have noted in my time, and I suppose this will qualify me for having gone around the globe, and that is the tremendous emergence of the Far East and the Pacific area on American consciousness. In the early days in the Foreign Service, no one would have thought very much more, very much about those areas. I started out my international career with General MacArthur in Japan. So uh, when, I, when one looks at Japan today and what it means on the world economic scene, in every sense, you can see the kind of change that uh, has occurred. I returned there as American, as Assistant Secretary of State in 1978, I believe, after having left in 1949, I didn't recognize the country. But the thing is, Japan is not uh, unusual. You look at all of those countries, and the example that they have given of dynamism, of the potential for growth, of progress while maintaining a sound political base is something that's comforting. What happened in the Philippines recently is the kind of thing that shows you the dynamism, the will, that lies within these people. And it gives us hope that there can be an example for the rest of the world that freedom, democracy, progress can go together. This becomes extremely important for us right here at home because with all of these problems that, and challenges that we face, we at the same time have tremendous possibilities. We have a very diverse nation. We have an enormous amount of talent throughout this community. The problems we face are very diverse. They come from all parts of the world. And one of my hopes and one of the things that I work for with all the, the, the possibilities that I have is to see our government and our Foreign Service and our Department of State become far more representative of our nation because I know that there's enormous talent that is needed to be drawn on. When we face problems dealing with the third world, dealing with the Far East, dealing with areas that do not yet make up the basic cultural structure of America, we need the inputs that we can get from the various minorities within the United States. We need the input that we can get from women. And uh, I keep hoping that somehow we're going to succeed in doing that. And I'd like to ask a favor of you. And that is if you, if you would speak to every young person that you know who is trying to think of what to do for his life's work and to encourage them to come and, or that person, to come and lend America a hand. The challenges that we face are enormous, but our capacity for solving problems, for meeting challenges, is also enormous. It's shown it by our history, and I know that with your participation, with the kind of your work, the work that you do, we're going to continue to show it in the future.
Thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador, we thank you for being good enough to draw upon your extensive experience. Uh, I was wondering how Asia would get worked in there, and I didn't know that it all began with MacArthur in, in Japan. The Ambassador has touched, I think, on almost every part of the world in his uh, illustrious career, and we're thoroughly delighted that he shared this with us this evening. He's agreed to answer uh, questions until 10 minutes after 7. Yes, in the rear of the room, please. As I mentioned before, I'll repeat the questions for the benefit of our, our cameras. The uh, question is, is the lesson security in uh, Denmark and other Scandinavian uh, countries to which you referred earlier? I'd be very happy to, to respond to that. I would like to make clear that my reference to the fact that the incidents, terrorist incidents that occur in Denmark is quite different from saying that Denmark is not safe today. Uh, the point I intended to make is that terrorism is no respecter of place. So it's not to single out uh, Denmark or Scandinavia as such, it's to show that what we're dealing with is fundamentally a world problem. Uh, in answer to the specific question as to whether the presence of foreign workers, the number of people have been taken in, might be a causal factor in that. I would say no. I think that a great deal of the dynamism of America, of our growth, of our creativity, comes from what I like to call the creative tension that arises from the constant inflow of people into this country, the bringing in of an enormous variety and as they interact with each other, I think that they create this enormous genius that we have. I think this multi-ethnicity uh, is an important factor. Denmark has lived for a very long time with um, mainly Scandinavian people. And of course it is a shock to be faced for the first time with large numbers coming in. It certainly has an unsettling effect. I know that in the United States, each new wave or each community that's hit by each new wave feels that effect and it takes an adjustment period. But I don't think that the policy of admitting is one that has uh, caused this. And uh, in most cases, the incidents, they haven't found who've done it, so they can't identify and people have been able to get across, uh, get out of the country before being discovered. Denmark has set some very high standards for liberalism, for openness, for a way of looking at the world, and I hope that Denmark will continue to keep those standards so high. Yes, sir. <laughs> with with uh, the question is simply, would you comment upon Chad? On, on Chad. The ambassador catches himself much more quickly than most of our guests have, as you may have noted. <laughs> Uh, it reminded me of negotiating with the Cubans. My Spanish is bilingual, and so I would understand what the, uh, the Cuban negotiator was saying. And uh, every now and then, instead of waiting for the interpretation from my translate, I would start to answer, and she'd tap me in the finger, and I'd go back and say, oops. Uh, so I've, I've been trained, you see, in that. Chad is one of these very, very sad cases. I happen to have been ambassador uh, in Chad at the beginning of the problems that have led to this real misery. And I remember President Tumbal Bai uh, asking me to come see him one day. And he read to me a cable he had just received from Gaddafi uh, saying, I know that you have uh, an Israeli embassy with an ambassador and two other people there and that you have four Israeli technicians helping in uh, reforestation. I want you to throw them out. And if you do, I will provide all of the assistance that you want. And if you don't, I'll see to it that you're sorry that you didn't. And Tumbalbai said, I just want you to know that I'm going to tell him that I'm the 
the chief, the president of a sovereign country, and I don't take uh, that kind of word coming from anyone, I'm going to run my country the way I'd like to. And it wasn't too long after that that the uh, Tulus in the north had new, modern, powerful arms, and you started getting a lot of the attacks up in the northern part of that country. And it was one of the things that continued and led to the, the deteriorated situation that we have today. I say that fully respecting the fact and recognizing that Chad as a country has a certain number of problems that make it difficult to really work as a country. During the French period, they knew that there were uh, as many elements for separation as for binding, and for example, they never tried to control, to manage, to administer the North. They would go up once a year and have a great uh, tribal feast, uh, some good, um, good mutton and, and some, some, some good wine and, uh, or whatever else people would drink, and they'd pled mutual allegiance to each other and that was the end of it. When the new government uh, came in after independence, uh, any self-respecting president would say, as this one did, I've got to be in charge of the whole area. The educated people and the ones that he knew and could call on all came from the southern uh, African religious uh, or Christian part of the country, and they were the ones who were appointed all over. People who had little knowledge of the customs and the expectations of the people over whom they were put to to, uh, to, to govern. Uh, also, uh, bonds were floated and people were asked to buy bonds and if you bought one for a dollar, you figure you ought to get twenty dollars worth of service out of it. Well, there wasn't enough to do that. So there were several things internally within the situation which made for great instability. But I'm convinced that the key element in bringing about this deterioration that leads to where we are today was that decision by uh, Gaddafi to punish uh, Chad for not responding to his wishes. Where and how this would all end, I don't have a crystal ball, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Would you comment upon the Scandinavian view of American foreign policy, uh, specifically that toward the Soviet Union, arms control, and Nicaragua? With pleasure. These, <laughs> I can start out on a generalization that the Scandinavians think we're wrong on most of those things. Uh, as far as the Soviet Union, to think that we're not uh, flexible enough, that we don't give in as, as quickly, that we don't respond positively to Soviet uh, initiatives. I find myself being obliged to keep repeating that uh, an initiative announced by Soviet chairman to a Communist Party meeting in an Eastern European country isn't an initiative. We do have negotiating places where it should be presented. Uh, on nuclear arms, they disagree uh, very much with, uh, with our policy. Uh, we said then that there is a need for conventional defense, and they prefer not to put money into conventional defense. They recognize that the nuclear umbrella is protecting them as well. I say Scandinavia, and perhaps I fell into a trap because there are such varieties within Scandinavia. Uh, Denmark is a member of NATO and is a loyal member, although it footnotes some of the decision. Norway is a member. Sweden, of course, is not. Sweden maintains the capacity to protect itself. Uh, on in, in the case of uh, Central America and Nicaragua, they disagree with us also and think that somehow we are being abusive to a small country and not allowing it to do what um, it, it wants to do. And I think that approach generally overlooks the fact that the Nicaraguan people aren't allowed to express what they want to do, that they're living under an oppressive regime that, that gives no leeway for their development. Uh, they uh, take an approach, and I'm back to the generalizing, that they are very much closer to the Soviet Union and so the impact is felt greater. This is something that extends to Europe and it extends to many people who 
unfortunately keep focusing on the flat map of the earth. The United States is across the Atlantic. Uh, at least they recognize that Columbus didn't fall off, but they still see the world as flat, not as a sphere. They, they fail to focus on the fact that uh, parts of the United States are quite as close to the Soviet Union, in fact closer than many parts of Europe, ju just across the, uh, the, the North Pole. And this does not come into their consciousness. They see us as being very far removed and therefore not thinking, uh, not being concerned with the pressures of immediacy that they feel. I think that as this dialogue continues, there is getting to be a greater realization that we're not really wild people, that we are rational in what we're doing, and that there are sound bases. I think we're getting nearer to each other, but there's certainly a lot more room for a meaningful dialogue. Yes, sir. The observation was made that uh, American foreign policy has become militarized. Um, is that so? And if so, does that reflect a uh, failure of diplomacy or leadership? I would say none of the above. Uh, I don't think that our foreign policy is any more militarized now than it was before. I don't think that the presence of warships is threatening. Otherwise, the presence of Soviet ships off Norfolk and around uh, all of the American coast, very close, would then also be threatening and provocative. Freedom of the seas is one of the fundamental principles of international relations. And I, I certainly hope that we're going to continue to insist on respect for freedom of the seas. Uh, as far as its relation to the diplomatic side, I think that if you ever try to practice diplomacy and don't have any power behind you, you will find that you're not able to exercise any influence at all. If you practice, uh, if you use military force without any diplomacy, then you can really wreak havoc. And what we try to seek and what we have to continually try to seek is to have the military power as a backup which allows our diplomatic presentations to carry more weight because of the awareness of those who are dealing with that that is available as a last resort if it had to be used. We have to rely, we continue to rely, and I know that this country, because of its makeup, will continue to rely on political negotiated solutions. Diplomacy has to be the answer. And one of the reasons that I, I am happy to be with groups like this is because we need your inputs into a foreign policy. We run a democracy, we are responsive, and the greater amount of participation that we have from all who are concerned, the more the sounder our policy is likely to be. Yes, sir. Person. The observation was the mere existence of nuclear weapons constitutes a serious threat to mankind. Witness the meltdown in the Soviet Union. Uh, would the ambassador comment on that unofficially, personally, as opposed to making an official statement, Mr. Ambassador? I'm, I'm very happy that you added that part because I would like to emphasize that the remarks that I'm making tonight have not been at all cleared by anyone. As a matter of fact, I mentioned at first that one of the great pleasures I had in the title was that it said an ambassador's view, the very well could have said one ambassador's view. Uh, obviously, I deal enough on the policy so that I think I reflect reasonably well, but I'm speaking personally. To the specifics of your, of your question, the goal of the United States is today, as it was in 1945, as it has been, in all of our activities against nuclear proliferation to end the existence of nuclear arms, to get rid of them totally. That's what we are working for. The problem, that is truly what we are working for. The problem is how do you approach it? It's not something that we can do unilaterally. It's something that has to be negotiated. And in our experience with dealing with the Soviets, 
they are more ready to negotiate when they feel that there is a counter on the other side. Chernobyl is a terrible case, it's a tragedy, and our first reaction to it was one of a tragedy. What can we do to help? When the Soviets finally agreed to admit that what the Swedes were reporting uh, was correct. Uh, looking at uh, space and at the question of SDI, there would not be Chernobyl's floating around in the air. The President's uh, request was that we try to find non-nuclear means, if possible, to protect the country. Uh, we have agreed and signed a treaty which we've ratified and which we respect not to put weapon, nuclear, uh, weapons of mass destruction in space. What would have to go into space, obviously, are sensors, ge uh, geosynchronous or other satellites, which would be able to tell when there has been a launch. So there isn't you know, a Chern uh, Chernobyl that can come out of that. What the technology is finally going to be, I don't know. What I do know is that we've got to change this reliance on offensive nuclear weapons. We've got to get rid of nuclear weapons, and that's what we want to do. We tried very hard to do that. You recall the Baruch plan, when we were the only ones who had it. Well, Mr. P, uh, the president still makes foreign policy, and Mr. Baruch did this under instructions from President uh, Truman, and our policy really has not changed. And we could have stopped it then. We weren't allowed to. We want to stop it at every single point. And the history of American proposals uh, for arms reduction, for elimination of arms, is not one that we need to be ashamed of. But on all these matters, we need two sides. We can't do it alone. We have to maintain a reasonable balance so that we're building down together, reducing together, and maintaining some kind of stability for this country. I share your hope, and I share it very sincerely and very deeply, that we're not going to get into anything that amounts to an arms race in space or the placing of dangerous weapons in space. And I have a personal feeling of certainty that we are committed to that and that that's what we're trying to do in our negotiations with the Soviets. The, uh, the observation is that a large number feel that the Arab states have a legitimate point of view, the Arab people, and that uh, the second observation is that terrorism will have a capacity in the future beyond that which it has now. And I believe the question is to comment on the relationship of those two observations. With pleasure. They are both extremely well founded. I don't think that in the case of the first one, it runs into any conflict at all with the American government's official approach to this. We have worked long and hard. We continue to work as hard as we possibly can for a peaceful solution to the Me Middle East situation, which in fact does recognize the rights of the Arab people, which is based on the United Nations resolution that has as its core the right of Israel to exist within free and secure boundaries. The basis for an agreement is there. We recognize that both elements are there. And the constant effort of American diplomacy is to try to get the parties involved in this to sit down and try to work this out. We do not accept the fact that the use of terrorism is a way to approach a solution to these problem, nor in fact that, can it, that it can bring about a solution to any of these problems. This is not going to do it. The solution has to be found. It has to be one that does recognize the legitimate interests of the, of the Arab people, of all the peoples concerned. And we are working on that, and we will continue to work on that. And I think we have made it clear that with the acceptance of the resolution, which accepts Israel's rights to exist, 
We are encouraging the parties to get together and work on this. What you mentioned about a possibility of terrorist uh, groups or countries which support terrorism getting nuclear weapons is one of the nightmares that I know many people have. And it's one of the reasons why when one talks about not trying to get any kind of a shield, that it's something that the president really does not understand why they're taking that position. I remember him telling me once about the attitude taken towards gas masks when there was agreement that chemical weapons would not be used. People said, well, we don't need to continue uh, any more research on gas masks. Some others said, maybe we'd better. And those who did were very happy that they did because despite the outlawing, there have always been the incidental cases where it has happened. Our uh, awareness of this possibility of the uh, of terrorist groups or countries that support terrorism getting weapons has also been the basis for uh, many conversations with the Soviet Union insisting that we must find ways to get confidence in each other, to tell each other what is happening, so that an accidental use by some outside group does not trigger a nuclear response and an escalation. We have been pressing as hard as we can, and we will continue to do so, with everyone who has nuclear technology, to try to get them to realize that it is not in anybody's interest to let nuclear capability get in the hands of those who would use it for terrorist purposes. We're going to continue with that, and I hope in the interest of all of us that we will succeed. We only have time for uh, two more questions. Uh, the gentleman in the last row, and then the gentleman on the far left side, and the, my left side. There, there are two questions. Uh, the first is, um, do you think that perhaps Star Wars represents a error in the judgment of the potential of defensive military technology, analogous to the error about defensive military technology made between the two world wars? And then secondly comment upon the large costs of pursuing that kind of technology, especially in light of uh, the uh, costs that may be incurred by the United States with respect to economic competition. I'd be very happy to comment on that. I think that the analogy between the Strategic Defense Initiative and the Maginot Line are really uh, overdrawn. The Strategic Defense Initiative is a, re is a research project. We don't know today what it is going to produce. The decision on whether, in fact, to have something that would be deployed is going to be made only after the research has proven that we can develop a system that is effective at the margins. That is, it would be less expensive to produce defensive systems than could be overwhelmed by counter-offensive system. That decision is going to be made by a future American president and presented to a Congress of the United States, which you will elect. So that there's no question that this is something that we're going to go ahead and do. But when we know that the Soviet Union has been working for the last 20 years and devoting an enormous amount of money to, to developing defensive systems at the same time that it's been building an overwhelming defense, I think that it really would, would be irresponsible on our part not to investigate the possibilities. What we have done in investigating these possibilities, or since it has started, is to go to the Soviet Union and to say, look, we both have an interest in ridding the world of the threat that exists now of offense and counter offense. Let's sit down and talk together on how each of us can develop some, some kind of a system that will reduce the reliance on offense, counter defense, and that will help to build the security 
on defense and we can build down, we can begin to get rid of these nuclear weapons, these offensive weapons that are now threatening us. And I think that when you examine it in, in that light, to make a comparison of that with the Maginot Line is overdrawing it a bit. On the question of America's competitiveness because of the costs involved in doing this, we just got started on the project. And America, the question of America's economic competitiveness isn't something that just came up the other day. It has come up because of the enormous burden that we've been carrying for the rest of the world and for ourselves in, in, in offensive weapons, counter-offensive weapons to provide for, for the defense of the kinds of things we believe in. And we don't know how much a system is going to cost. But where does it get to be too costly for us to say that we need to protect ourselves? This is a question that each one has to answer. And what I hope will happen in this group and happen in our country is that there will be a meaningful debate of how do we go about providing for the security of America, what are the alternatives, what will bring more security, and then come up with the kind of democratic solutions that we reach on things like this. But I think that uh, the votes are not yet in, and we have to keep looking. And America has been through periods of slump before, and this great country has pulled through. And I know that it's going to happen again. I just have no reason, no reason to doubt it. And I think to shift from a strategy of relying on offense, counter-offense, to reliance on a strategy of defense is going to bring more peace of mind to us and will allow us to devote more efforts to exactly the kinds of developments that we need to do. And you say we've been spending all our money in that area while others have been spending in, in more productive things. I would challenge that also. I think that the United States has been continuing to spend on productive areas. And I think if you look around the technological developments in the world, we're not doing too badly. Mr. Ambassador, uh, we regret very much that our evening must of necessity end. We appreciate your experience and good sense which you've shared from us. And even though our time has been relatively short, uh, you have our gratitude for coming here and sharing it so nicely with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for being such a great audience.